Soft Engineering Radio, episode 136, Past, Present and Future of Model Driven Architecture with David Frankel. This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions and interviews on software engineering topics every 10 days. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for support. Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Software Engineering Radio. My name is Dirk Riele. I'm your host today, straight from the Silicon Valley, as a kind of subsidiary for the Software Engineering Radio. It's my first show. Uh, you can learn about me at www.riele.org, uh, dot org. But uh, my guest today is David Franke, a colleague at SAP Labs here in the Silicon Valley. Hi, Dave. Hi, Turk. Glad to have you. Thanks. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk here. Mm -hmm. Our topic today is uh, model-driven architecture, uh, past, present, uh, and future. We will be taking both a uh, somewhat broader uh, sweep at, uh, than previous episodes have done. And we'll also be talking about David's uh, long tenure on the subject, as well as his most recent, th recent thoughts and activities. Um, I noticed it was actually fun to see you're a colleague here, and I could interview you for MDA. We first met, I believe, at UBS in Zurich over 10 years ago, when you were doing some of the earlier MDA projects, one might say, that actually won a prize, I remember, at the, uh, at the um, it was the Global Business Object Project. Right, right. Do you remember that? Great. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was with Hans-Peter Hoyden and the uh, at UBA. Yeah, yeah sure. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Those were the heydays of Corba. Um, is Corba already <laughs> MDA-level work? Well, uh, it's interesting what happened with Corba. I, I don't normally associate Corba directly with MDA except that they both come out of the OMG. So mm -hmm. there is a connection. Mm -hmm. uh, CORBA, uh, just in terms of what happened with CORBA, it, um, if you're in enterprise computing, CORBA appears to have died. Mm -hmm. um, it is, there's certain parts of Cor uh, CORBA, um, the CORBA security, the CORBA transaction service, and IIOP are buried deep in the plumbing of, J of uh, Java Enterprise. And mm -hmm. actually you have to have those to uh, get certification for Java Enterprise. But, but CORBA, in enterprise computing, CORBA lost the battle of the programming model to Java. The programming model that surfaces to the programmer, that's yeah. what we mean by programming model, mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, uh, that CORBA lost that battle. However, in embedded in real-time sources, it's very much alive. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the OMG today, the, the, the sort yeah. of, it's kind of, they have quarterly meetings and there's just you know, about two, 250, 300 people come and there's a lot of activity. Both in both in the MDA stack and in the Corpus stack. In the Corpus mm -hmm. stack, it's all real-time embedded systems of people mm -hmm. that are involved in that, and it's very much alive there. You take a company like Thales, a big uh, you mm -hmm. know the big engineering firm in uh, SEP, probably has about seventy-five thousand people based in France, is with sharp, strong presence all over uh, Western Europe. Uh, they have a very deep commitment to MDA. They've rolled out mm -hmm. from their, their central architecture group in Paris a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, have Commitment to not only but MDA and CORBA, they use the CORBA component model as their runtime. So they mm -hmm. have MDA, they have runs, they have uh, MDA, they use the MDA stack for their modeling tools, and the, and they have a lot of code generation or model mm -hmm. execution, and their their uh, execution platform is CORBA component model, mm -hmm. which is also known as CORBA 3. Okay. So, so the background of my question was the thought that CORBA tried to establish service architectures. Mm -hmm. And I thought, or maybe you can help me clarify that, what's the connection between the attempt to modernize uh, traditional software systems with service architectures, well-defined services and interactions, and MDA? Yeah, well, uh, so if you want to put Corber in that, in, you know, analyze Corber from that perspective, and then MDA. So Corba. Actually, when people, when the, it was initially being worked on in the or, or first part of the 90s, mm -hmm. 
the vision that people were talking about was very, very similar to what people talk about with service-oriented architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the first major book that was written about Corba probably was, it wasn't a, wasn't a very technical book, it was written by Mike, uh, it was called Object Technology Revolution, written by Mike Gutman, mm -hmm. and who's one of the original um, authors of IAOP. And their colleagues. And, uh, and Jason Matthews, mm -hmm. right. And if you read that book, the vision they lay out mm -hmm. is the same vision that people are laying out about, you know, loosely covered coupled services mm -hmm. with, you know, and that they just thought Corbel was going to be the technical mechanism for describing these interfaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, well, you know, really, the, what, what happened was uh, Corbel, for various reasons, and uh, Corbel was not broadly adopted. Microsoft resisted adopting Corbel. They went their own way, you know, mm -hmm. with Common and DCOM. Yeah. And there was always this split. And... Uh, uh, you, today, with it, with SOA that's based on um, your web services, yes, the vision is basically the same. Mm -hmm. And technically, in a sense, by build, rebuilding this web services stack, we kind yeah. of rebuilt a stack. I, I, it's, it's it's debatable whether it was rebuilt in a more efficient way than mm -hmm. it was with with the Corvus stack. However, the real difference is not technical, but it's it's the fact that. It had broad, uh -huh. had broad industry adoption. That Microsoft was on board. <laughs> you know, all the all the comp everybody was on board, and that makes it, that's a very substantial yeah. difference. You know that that really uh, and and that's why it's gotten you know it's gotten more broad. It's getting mm -hmm. broader adoption, uh, yeah. and Corba ends up sort of often a niche mm -hmm. in the in the real time embedded systems. Yeah, you're you're making an important point that I wanted to to come to too. Um, still. Let me just ask, were there any lessons to be learned from Corba about things that didn't work too well, but that had an influence on how later MDA technology stacks were built? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But one of the things was that, uh, for, well, there are two things. First of all, a Corba, a def definition of a Corba interface mm -hmm. is a purely syntactical thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely straight syntax. It gives yeah. you the signature mm -hmm. of the operations of the interface. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is no attempt whatsoever to ca capture any kind of semantic content. Mm -hmm. Now, one could argue that, okay, you know, there's a separation of concerns. Maybe that's just about the syntax. Okay, fine, and mm -hmm. you, you put the semantics somewhere else. But the where to put the somewhere the semantics in a yeah. machine readable form was never really addressed. Yeah. Oh. That that was one problem. The second problem was as Java, as, as it became clear that Corba was not going to be the only distributed, the only platform distri for distributed computing, mm -hmm. you really had to think about, well, you know, can we do, you know, raising the level of abstraction another level, I mean, you have to have something that you could, you could do specifications where you would, that would be free of, of having to be forced at that point to make the choice between Corba or uh, you know, Java Enterprise mm -hmm. or something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that got us thinking that, you know, well, this is the reality of what's going on in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, uh, you know, you had to, and there was some of this, you know, then at the same time there was the modeling, the stuff was going on mm -hmm. in the modeling world. So Corba was, a, it's a textual, you know, um, IDL, mm -hmm. interface description language, is purely textual. There's really no modeling, uh, mm -hmm. no visual modeling language, and you. This was the time when visual modeling languages were rising, object-oriented. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was sort of another part of the object-oriented camp was this modeling camp, and you had the three camps. You know, you had Rose, mm -hmm. uh, you you know, you had Grady Booch, you had Jim Rumbaugh, yeah. you had Jacobson, Jacobson. You know, they were all. Well, you know, like around '97, they all come together, the three of them, the three amigos, the three <laughs> amigos, and OMG. Mm -hmm gets the rights to the UML. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was the first thing that OMG ever had that was not Corba based. Mm -hmm. And that was controversial inside of, inside of uh, mm -hmm. the OMG. So yeah. Why are we getting into something that's not Corba? Yeah. And so the argument, the counter argument was, well, look, you know, it's evident that there's going to be more than one distributed object computing platform mm -hmm. and we need and also, we don't, you know, we we we're the object management group. We've neglected the object. We've neglected the modeling side, mm -hmm. you know. So that argument won the mm -hmm. day, and that also know. from a semantics perspective, because that's not exactly your strong suit. 
Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, the UML has, has more capability to mm -hmm. model semantics than people realize, but it's capa mm -hmm. those capabilities are typically not used. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the typical UML model that, uh, you know, somebody in an IT, you know, organization for some project produces, mm -hmm. I would say that those models really, when you come down to it, are purely syntactical. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're defining um, classes with, opera, you know, with um, attributes and operations, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's not that much different than an IDL yeah. interface, it's just with, it's pictures, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. it's slightly different rules than IDL. But plus they have, okay, they have other dimensions. They have the sequence diagrams mm -hmm. and the state diagrams and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so with that, you can, but the, the class diagrams, Mm -hmm. It themselves are purely syntactical, and mm -hmm. you can start exactly. to get at some of the semantics of the operations. You can model them, and mm -hmm. with um, with uh, you can model their state. You know their their state mm -hmm. machines. You can model the them through activity modeling. Uh, mm -hmm. But the um, the class there's an awful lot of class modeling that goes on in UML, and that mm -hmm. does not take advantage of the fact that the UML has the object constraint language mm -hmm. OCL. Yeah. Now. It's a first-order predicate lo uh, mm -hmm. uh, logic, and it allows you to specify uh, invariant rules mm -hmm. and preconditions and postconditions for your yeah. operations in terms of your structural information model mm -hmm. uh, in a way that is mathematically precise, even though you can, your models can be mm -hmm. at a very high level of abstraction. That begins to... You, you start to get at more semantics. I mean, a lot of OCL... Particularly the invariant rules, mm -hmm. you know, we are sort of ruling out corner cases. But mm -hmm. some of it, you know, like you know, would, would, would fall. In other words, they would fall under the category more of like a well-formedness rule. Mm -hmm. right. But a lot of it is it starts to get in the area of business rules. Like if this, mm -hmm. okay, if you know the value of this of a por of the portfolio is more than a million dollars, then if this and if the date, you know, is, is after mm -hmm. July fifteenth. And if this flag over here, whether this letter was sent to the regulatory authority, is yeah. is false, you've got yeah. a problem, right? Okay, so, so that's what you're saying. You can actually do some behavioral modeling of, uh, of your, or more precise behavioral that's, modeling. Let's say more precise semantics, mm -hmm. and with the you can actually do some be behavioral modeling with the pre and post conditions, particularly mm -hmm. the post conditions, because with the post conditions you can say, we'll just take a typical mm -hmm. um, an operation that you might have in a business system like to roll over uh, end of end of month receivables roll over. Mm -hmm. You know, you roll over current thirty yep. days and thirty to sixty, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You can specify that in you, know, you okay. can specify that behavior in OCL. Yeah. So um, I already see we have a long list of topics and yeah. uh, we are drawing here really on your uh, I guess tremendous breadth and depth of experience. What I didn't do in the beginning, and uh, listeners probably got an initial glance at it from, from the website, but maybe you want to shortly talk about your role in this, because I remember listening to you at ETH Zurich and talk about the Corba component model, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. I don't want to go back yet uh, too much to Corba yet, but you've definitely been involved in some of these standardization efforts. And maybe you want to talk about uh, what you did in that respect. In the Corba component model? Starting there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I, I was involved in the team that specified the Corba component model, mm -hmm. and we were trying to go, I mean, we were going to, it was a big step beyond mm -hmm. the uh, uh, basic Corba uh, mm -hmm. because it gave us a model for, uh, you could say, you, now you could model a component that provided and required interfaces. Mm -hmm. It could provide multiple interfaces, require multiple interfaces, and you could, and then it had the notion of assemblies, mm -hmm. where you could take these, you could plug a required port. They, we call them ports, mm -hmm. required ports, and, and uses ports. Yeah. And you could take these. Uh, I'm sorry, the required ports and provides ports essentially. Mm -hmm. You could take these and you could use them as the basis for wiring components together mm -hmm. in an assembly. So now you have a you you create um, a, 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 a larger component or an application that is an assembly of mm -hmm. these components. It was a much more advanced model than EJB, actually, mm -hmm. because EJB did not have that. It had it basically covered everything EJB covered, but it had this whole notion of required and uses mm -hmm. ports, which EJB didn't have. In this, this, so, which gave you a much, um, a much more powerful assembly mm -hmm. model. Uh, but yeah. 
We talked earlier uh, before we started the podcast about yeah. uh, Shaw and Garland's work on software architecture. Mm -hmm. So uh, that sounds, uh, the core component model as you describe it, sounds pretty much like an architectural description language. Is that MDA level work or a precursor or should MDA have that or not? You know, or it's really a different dimension? Well, I... To me, I mean, the, the overriding for MDA is, is raising the level of abstraction mm -hmm. in how we develop software. MDA, in one sense, is a brand. It's a corporate, it's, I mean, <laughs> sorry, it's an OMG brand. Mm -hmm. they, they have, it's a registered trademark, you know, right. and that there's a stack of, you know, uh, UML and XMI, certain technologies, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which are sort of more sort of um, philosophically model-driven systems in general is an effort mm -hmm. to raise the level of abstraction. Now, corporate did that to some extent. I mean, it raised the level, for its day, it raised the level of abstraction above the programming language mm -hmm. because there, and then there were programming language bindings, mm -hmm. right? So you could, you could specify an interface or you could specify a component and it was independent of whether there was mm -hmm. going to be an implementation in Corba or Java. And in fact, the client, and that you could have a client and a server that one mm -hmm. was in one the client might have been accessing the component and the client might be written in Java, mm -hmm. the server might be written in uh, C plus plus and it, it, it you know you could do that. So they were raising the level of abstraction uh, above the programming language, above the operating system, mm -hmm. uh, and in a sense MDA was just the next step. It raised it mm -hmm. above the distributed object computing platform. Uh, And uh, these notions of um, provides and required component uh, mm -hmm. required components are um, just ways to uh, they, they just give you new tools to be able mm -hmm. to. You don't have to write the um, uh, as quite as much mm -hmm. uh, low level code to connect mm -hmm. these things because the language bindings. Mm -hmm. for the Corbett component model yeah. provided a lot of the mechanics of how you'd have to hook these things together, right? right? So that's, but you know, there was an evolution, what I, the way I, I look at it is this, there was an evolution going on. At, at that point in time, mm -hmm. which would say the late 90s, by then, we had already, re, essentially, we were doing already model-driven de development mm -hmm. on the front ends of our systems mm -hmm. and on the back ends. If you think about it, let's, talk, let's take, take mm -hmm. the back end. Who was programming, you know, B plus trees in low in low level code mm -hmm. to do an enterprise application in the late 90s? By then, yeah. you're using database management systems. Mm -hmm. You you would create a data model, mm -hmm. a schema. You feed it into the, the database management system. It would do all the heavy lifting. Yeah. Yes, you do some fine tuning with triggers and stored procedures and stuff like that. But you know, most of the heavy lifting was done by the by the database management system using the data model, right? Mm -hmm. Front end. The last time I wrote a C++, you know, message loop for Windows was mm -hmm. when I discovered Microsoft Foundation classes in, okay. in you know, <laughs> That's a while back. Nine, nine, you know, 1994, mm -hmm. and you know, Microsoft Foundation classes, what they allowed you to do, and UI development mm -hmm. is very much like this today. Okay, you create you you create your user interface, your dialog. You paint mm -hmm. it with a what what you see is what you get mm -hmm. dialog editor. You push a button that generates a bunch of code. There's yeah. places where you add you have to add all the you know mm -hmm. um, UI event handlers. Yeah. So you're saying this is all uh, different technologies, but kind of inspired by the idea of uh, increasing the level of abstraction, be model driven. We were already uh -huh. doing it in the front ends and the back ends of the systems. And what you start seeing with, Cor with Corba and the efforts with MDA mm -hmm. is really about was com completing, sort of getting the mid tiers as we're starting to develop mid tiers mm -hmm. in our systems with web based things and you know distributed computing. Yeah. yeah. Coping with the heterogeneity yeah. of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you? But still, you've given us examples now, and maybe to clarify. Um, but what would you say is essential about MDA? Is that can you define it in absolute terms, or is it always a relative movement towards more levels of abstraction? Well, the way I've tried to introduce it is sort of with a theory of permanent revolution. You know, mm -hmm. I okay. mean, the, the yeah, I mean, we we um, we're always looking for ways to. I mean, the holy grail is you specify the the, the business behavior of your system and it executes, mm -hmm. right? 
we're not really there, but you know, we there are certain uh, ways in which we're getting closer to that. Mm -hmm. And there's a um, and so uh, that's really what we're after. That mm -hmm. that's sort of like the we're as, we we will asymptotically approach that. You know, mm -hmm. even asymptotically yeah. might be too optimistic, but we gradually we really, we raise that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a fun, coming to a fundamental question, which is, is programming and modeling something very different or not? Because if all you do is, in both cases, so you are specify in some form, uh, you might argue that programming is just modeling with abstractions, programming abstractions that are just not as high level as you wish. While programmers typically would say, yeah, the modeling abstraction are just not complete and consistent and orthogonal enough to actually give me the power to be complete such that it runs out of the box. Right. So, so how, how would you? Well, I think that the line between programming and, mm -hmm. and modeling is, a, is somewhat fuzzy, mm -hmm. okay? Because, in, 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 you know, you're always operating at some, you know, some level of abstraction above what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we've gone from, you know, yeah. no microcoding, <laughs> ones and zeros to assemblers to compiler, you know, I mean, third generation languages. So. I think that if, if you really want to get intellectually rigorous of it, it gets pretty hard to define mm -hmm. the difference. Um, I think you make a really important point about one of the things that turns uh, 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 IT people off mm -hmm. to what they see in the modeling, what, what's called mm -hmm. the modeling world, and that's the imprecision of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, there, there is a role... There is a role for um, casual modeling, let's mm -hmm. say, or informal modeling. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, there also is an important role for making. I mean, with with something like UML, you'll oftentimes see models that uh, the one of the attributes will have a type. It, it'll be of a certain type, but mm -hmm. the type's not defined anywhere. They'll just yeah. call it date, but you mm -hmm. didn't define your date type anywhere, right? Yeah. Or uh, the other part of it is they don't use the ability to specify any of the constraints. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. it's all very, it's loose, it's imprecise, and developers look at that and they they say, this is fluff, mm -hmm. you know, how's this going to help me? Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe this helps me a little bit visualize the what I'm yeah. supposed to do, but that, it, you know, now, on the other hand, when you introduce the methodologies of using these modeling languages, with real precision and thinking mm -hmm. about what is computationally complete at that mm -hmm. level of abstraction, yeah. uh, and they start to introduce, I find when I start to introduce them to, yeah, you can use these constraint languages, mm -hmm. and, and then you can generate your J mm -hmm. units out of that. Later yeah. you could, well, then it, 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 it starts to change in terms of the debate is when they can see that A, it is really rigorous, mm -hmm. and B, that it, if it actually helped them get their work done because it saves them. Mm -hmm. And I oftentimes do go back to say, Step back a minute, you know, mm -hmm. when you do, a, a, you know, you, there's a lot of code generation, you're already raising level of abstraction, you yeah. know, in, in many right. ways. You don't do the EJB object class, you don't write that by hand. That's generated mm -hmm. by, the, mm -hmm. by the application server, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, okay. Um, so, so, but in my mind, this raises the question that it's almost also a social problem because you have architects doing UML and programmers having to implement it in Java or, <coughs> or fix up holes and generate a Java skeleton code. And if only programmers, or if this distinction between architect and programmer that we are trying to establish, we are not even there yet, but it uh, seems to be a goal of the industry to have these roles more precisely um, defined, uh, then, then the architect's tool just does not deliver yet what the builder or the programmer needs? Oh, a lot of it is about tooling, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, now, there are, there are some tools out there that do, mm -hmm. that do pretty interesting things and will, within, for certain classes of applications, mm -hmm. you know, within their, their world, their sphere that they're attacking, will do yeah. a pretty good job. Uh, and one of, the problems, one of the problems is a lot of the early tools tried to really attack the whole universe. In other words, they were very opposite of domain specific. They mm -hmm. were just trying yeah. to come up with their their code generation formulations to handle all kinds of applications and that's a really difficult problem. Yeah. I mean, you know, really you need to, if you're going to use UML, you need to profile it to the domain mm -hmm. you're working with and you need to write, if you're going to do code mm -hmm. generation, you need to write code generators that are 
understand your um, your UML profile. That for most industrial oh. in, for industrial scale applications, if you don't do that, it's very hard to do to to do it without. That's that. interesting. I never thought about it. So in my mind. You have, if you're programming, you have your Java IDE, and you expect that to be completely supporting what you have, the language, all its features, and then a host of tools that somehow make it easier to cope uh, with a language like Java. So you're saying for UML, we don't just need a UML IDE that can cope with all the UML features, but rather you would pare it down or say you really get very selective views depending on your job? What's emerging, the, the kind of generic UML tools you're seeing today implement the UML profiling mechanism. So UML, UML was architected from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The architects never expected that it would be sufficient in and of itself for industrial applications out of the box. Mm -hmm. They gave it uh, extension mechanisms, which are, you use mm -hmm. to build UML profiles. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, UML does not out of the box give you a way to model uh, security, mm -hmm. uh, to model you know, quality of service. Mm -hmm. uh, I can go on, there's lots of things, or mm -hmm. you know, specific things about certain domains. So. Uh, there, you, you're, yeah. you're not talking, well, you're, you're both talking, it seems to me, about functional uh, specific application domains and some functional uh, domains, uh, not on functional uh, requirements mm -hmm. like security, mm -hmm. and uh, but on the other hand, also extending the modeling abstraction. So the yes. libraries on the one hand, so like how to address security with this specific implementation technology, but also high level abstractions that are just not there. That's a good point. There is a, there's an, there's an architectural engineering trade-off between how much of the knowledge of the domain mm -hmm. do you put in reusable components and how mm -hmm. much do you put it in, put in your design of a, yeah. of a domain specific Dialect mm -hmm. and a compiler or interpreter that understands mm -hmm. that yeah. that knows how. So you know, you, there's 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 trade-offs there, and so what you see is people creating libraries of components, and then they mm -hmm. create a UML profile, mm -hmm. and then they create a. These tools all have the ability to plug in. They have yeah. APIs. You plug in your your code generators. The code, yeah. the generated code, calls your into your library mm -hmm. of components. Now there's interesting architectural trade-offs of how much you put in what space. Yeah. And UML, by the way, yeah. was as far as MDA goes, mm -hmm. UML was never expected to be able to handle all modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. the, the core of MDA is really the meta object facility, MOF, yeah. which is the meta modeling language, and mm -hmm. UML is defined in MOF. Yep. And there are other meta models that mm -hmm. the OMG, but there's lots of UML profiles that are being used either proprietary ones being used in industry, and also um, there are ones that have been standardized in the OMG. There's one for software radio. Mm -hmm. There's one for mm -hmm. specifically for real-time systems. Yeah. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I, um, I know the um, uh, for layer architecture pretty well. When, when I worked with it, profiles were really barely doable with the existing tools. That's Actually, right. the way we did domain-specific languages was literally as a extension of UML taking as an object-oriented framework and creating subclasses and coping with all of that. Yeah. Um, well, um, I had one more question in this space, which is to hear your thoughts on, on the idea of refinement. I remember um, way back, uh, probably by now, uh, uh, D'Souza and Wills, they had mm -hmm. a methodology called Catalysis, yeah. mm -hmm. which was trying to bridge between programming and um, more abstract architecture modeling, yeah. UML level modeling. Yeah by saying it's all really just a refinement process. And by that, they try to bring in precision and, uh, um, and basically bridge that gap between architect and uh, hand-waving architect and uh, code-slaying developer, basically. Uh, does did that fly? Is that still a guiding metaphor, uh, the notion of refinement? Or what are your thoughts? Well, uh, to some extent, yes, but uh, it really dep you really have to have tooling that manages mm -hmm. it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have tooling that, that does a really good job of managing the different levels, mm -hmm. it breaks down really quickly. Okay. And that's, a, that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Now, in the tooling area, I'll say this. Um, compared with five years ago, we're in much better shape. The, UML, mm -hmm. the, the new crop of UML tools for UML 2.0 is much better than what we had five years ago. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the profiling mechanisms are properly implemented, uh, it, it is much better. Um, but in terms of the tools being really intelligent about managing the levels of abstraction mm -hmm. for you, you're, 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 for the most part, you're still on your own. And mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to build in, you have to do a lot of work uh, with APIs and, yeah. you know, you're, you're building, using the APIs. So, um, you know, where um, there, there are some niche tools that do that certain, yeah. in certain niche areas. Um, but, uh, but we have, you know, so we, we've made progress, but there's, there's mm -hmm. room to, there's definitely room to go. By the way, there was always a big debate, mm -hmm. and this, this erupted as a big mm -hmm. debate. In, it came, became very a very religious debate <laughs> I have about, an idea. <laughs> about a, a, you know, a, a, when the Microsoft folks, my, my uh, good co colleagues of mine I, who, I, who I know and respect very much, wrote their Software Factories book, mm -hmm. you know, Jack Greenfield and uh, Steve Cook and uh, those mm -hmm. guys. Um, you know, they they came forward with a philosophy that very very strongly uh, was in favor of uh, mul uh, full round trip engineering at multiple right. levels at multiple levels of abstraction, where you mm -hmm. could do anything that you could do at the model level, you could do in the code, mm -hmm. and it would be reflected back upward, mm -hmm. or you could reflect downward. Yeah. There are re strong religious opinions mm -hmm. about that kind of thing. If you go to Steve Meller, like mm -hmm. you know Schleyer Meller, kind of, yeah. he's religious on the opposite pole. You know. Mm -hmm. Pure forward engineering, mm -hmm. you know, you put even the imperative mm -hmm. imperative code is an, an abstract a, a mm -hmm. action language in the UML model, mm -hmm. and you for, it's all forward generation. You do not touch the yeah. generated code. Yeah, you know, and then there's there's a hybrid hybrid approaches mm -hmm. in between. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, there, now the, if you do it all forward engineering, you don't well, have that prop. Yeah. I was about to say, so it's yeah. all about the impedance mismatch between exactly these different right. uh, levels. Exactly right. Did anyone, in your opinion, win? Are we at a level where forward engineering actually works? I mean, I don't look at assembly what? code any longer when I program because yeah. I don't have to. So on that level, it's translation and it's just fine, but uh, at not every level is there yet. And then, and then, and that, well, first of all, uh, I mean, uh, the Schleyer Meller approach, in which they later, when UML came around, they mm -hmm. migrated it to UML. I mean, they've, for decades, I mean, decades, mm -hmm. they've been doing very serious industrial work. It's all in embedded systems, mm -hmm. you know, like, but, you know, I mean, switch, you know, telecommunication switch boxes with, you know, millions of lines of code, mm -hmm. all generated, the, you know, through these act, you know, these, these things. I mean, that, that stuff has been, in, in in the embedded systems world, they're way they were, they've been way ahead of enterprise computing mm -hmm. in that. Some would argue because, and I tend to agree with this, although Steve does, Steve Mello I think would challenge me, but uh, I tend to think that in enterprise systems, um, you're dealing with so much legacy stuff. It's mm -hmm. just things aren't as normalized, and it's just harder to uh, it's harder to do. Uh, now you, the, the hybrid models, I mean, are you know, one of them is. Okay, so you talked about, well, you know, I don't look at the assembly code that my uh, compiler uh, mm -hmm. generates. So uh, I'm old enough to remember, you know, some of the early days when I was doing C programming, mm -hmm. um, you could do things like you could, you, you, we would do put hints to say to the uh, compiler, put this variable in a mm -hmm. register. Okay? Yeah. You know, or we could even drop down into it. You could actually yeah. embed assembly code, but the hints to the register. You know, mm -hmm. so in other words, we could sort of parameterize the compiler. We could. Yeah. You yeah. can still do that if you annotate things like how something is supposed to be mapped in a relational database rather than making mm -hmm. it completely right. transparent. So all kinds of levels still That's right. where you somehow need to help the underlying. That's right. uh, so that That's idea the, of transparency, it's, it's slowly. It's um, a continuum. Yeah. Um, so I'd be curious, we already had touched on the Corber versus DCOM wars. I don't want to go there again, but the important lesson, of course, was in terms of industry impact, you need to get all the relevant players on board. So Microsoft uh, was back then oppos opposing Corber and had its own uh, component model, DCOM, uh, distributed COM, and then distributed COM. And so, but that has changed. So, with the new web services world, um, kind of. Uh, 
How is that related to MDA? Is that just yet another technology stack that you can kind of look at from, from an MDA perspective to consider all the modeling techniques of VISPL and all that part of MDA, uh, ignoring for a while the, co the OMG trademark? Mm -hmm. Actually, it turns out that uh, when we look at where the low-hanging fruit for modeling, where the growth in modeling, uh, model-driven uh, approaches has occurred in the last several years, mm -hmm. it's actually occurred in that um, service-oriented area where the you're not generating an application. What you're generating is the glue code mm -hmm. that that orchestrates the invocation of services. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it may not be fully normalized as web services, although that's, that's the trend. And stuff like that. Yeah, uh -huh. and and um, that that turns out to be look. That's a, a less difficult problem than generating mm -hmm. all your business logic, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's a and and that turns out to be a it have been one of the one of the piece one of the things that was you know, lowest hanging on the tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I there was I actually wrote an article about this in Business Process Trends maybe about a year ago. Because uh, I had read a study, uh, I, I think it was IDC had done a study about where the growth in model-driven systems had occurred, and they, they were analyzing it, and that was one of their findings. And I thought that was really, really pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, well, that's the yeah. same old story as with Corva. It's like making different comp types of components from different sources, sources, basically making the heterogeneous world, world uh, co uh, co cooperate or uh, work together. Uh -huh. Right. So you know, it's still you know these these com these components that have the service-oriented interfaces on mm -hmm. them are largely still being hand coded mm -hmm. but the orchestration you know you know modeling that and generating mm -hmm. the glue uh, that's that's a lower hanging that's a, just a, mm -hmm. a, a lower hanging problem well, these components were hand coded because that's how they started out not necessarily because um, they uh, taking a model driven approach would have been the wrong thing for them or just maybe the model driven approach would have been the right thing, but it wasn't yeah. considered. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's many, yeah. many uh -huh. reasons. Yeah, okay. Uh, so th does that imply that uh, model driven architecture, uh, model driven uh, development is something for legacy systems? It just implies that it was one of the easiest problems to, mm -hmm. to, apply, to apply this to. Okay. I mean, and it, and it, that's way things tend to happen I and mean, we tend mm -hmm. to find the passive you know where where the real economic return is uh, mm -hmm. fast where, where you get the, the the fastest time to value let's just put yeah. it that way um, uh, that's how I see it uh, you also see this now that's evolving to mm -hmm. you know the notion of executable business process models mm -hmm. which is sort of a sort of in a sense a, a, a an, an embellishment of that yeah. you know because you model and and now you start you know well you have to be careful about the hype here i mean mm -hmm. um you know remember remember that that sort of holy grail you mm -hmm. know um goal of you specify the business behavior and it mm -hmm. just executes well i mean you're a little closer to that when you can specify the orc how the way that you uh, specify the orchestration of these services. Mm -hmm. You actually specify a business process model, you, mm -hmm. a business process model, mm -hmm. and then there's a generator that generates that orchestration yeah. code. It gets you a little closer, except those the business process model. The reason it's not really all the way there to that mm -hmm. ultimate goal is because the models that the business process models that are amenable to being generated, you can, you can generate yeah. that kind of stuff from, have to be extremely precise, and they're not the kind mm -hmm. that a, the average business person is just going yeah. to, uh, you know, sit down and write. Yeah, so, so, so it's interesting. So you, you've been talking about the business process execution language and many more uh, around that. All of these being new form the kind of new specifications, new languages, so no UML, no process modeling, DSLs derived or profiles from UML. Were there at least any learnings or is there any lineage or is it really just we are starting over again? Oh, well, I think that there, you know, I don't think it, uh, there's only a certain class of problems mm -hmm. to today that we can attack by mm -hmm. modeling a business process model and mm -hmm. having it executed by an execution engine. There are mm -hmm. still many classes of problems that the majority, we mm -hmm. still have to 
model an application. Mm -hmm. And UML is in use for that, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so, you know, there's just there's a number of different mo modalities. It. It, it could be used for modeling the app, and then... So it's fine. In some so, cases, mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, there, it, it just depends where you look. There are... There are I mean, if you, you go, go to the OMG and see some of the work that people are doing, mm -hmm. The people who are working on standards there generally they're 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 working on it in their industrial work, mm -hmm. so the um, yeah, there is a fair amount of it going on, but it's mm -hmm. still I mean the average development project is mm -hmm. still done is still done mo you know there's an awful lot of mm -hmm. low level coding, mm -hmm. but you can see it you can see that I mean if you look across industry the raising the level of abstraction mm -hmm. is there it may not always be with UML they yeah. might people have their homegrown tools different big companies might have their own modeling. Yeah. Languages, but you know more. You know, there, it, it, and you see the hybrid model, yeah. and y there is an inexorable thing happening. It, there, you may need extra specification languages for making existing specification languages more interoperable. Yeah, I'm half joking. Obviously. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> one of the purposes no of having a. a <laughs> well, that's one of the purposes of having a standardized meta modeling yeah. language. That's mm -hmm. why you want to have that. Mm -hmm. So that if you 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 have to have you I mean you do need different languages for different mm -hmm. stakeholders who have different perspectives on yes. the systems. They can't have the exact yeah. same set of abstractions. I didn't realize that. I, were you saying that Morph plays a role for the web services standardization efforts? No, they really hasn't. But it does yeah. in MDA. It's the yeah. core of the MDA stack. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm just saying that uh, to the extent that you have a common um, meta modeling language, it helps. Well, now. In, if you look at the IBM stat, I mean, mm -hmm. IBM, the way they implement a, a, a lot of their stuff, mm -hmm. they use EMF, mm -hmm. uh, the Eclipse Modeling Framework, which is essentially a, a, an implementation mm -hmm. of MOF. Mm -hmm. So they use it as a common meta modeling language for, and, and they use it for all their stuff, including their web, you know, including their web service implementations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe before we, uh, do you want to say some some more words about uh, about the web service specification efforts in general before we uh, before I let you draw a broad picture of MDA where you think we are and should be going? Uh, they've got it's it's gotten to be a very complex stack. Mm -hmm. so, so why do they call it? So they call sometimes they call it WS dash star and Sorry. sometimes they call it WS. Uh, Splat or something. Yeah, yeah splat. Oh, okay, no, I only I only hear the phrase uh, like WS Death Star, um, <laughs> which is kind of, I guess, a bit unfriendly from uh, Star Wars. But the point being, it is very you know, turning into a very complex uh, beast. Yeah. Well, uh, I th I think that. Uh, I, I myself have not played a strong role in defining those mm -hmm. web services specs, uh, and so you know I don't want to criticize my colleagues. I mean there are complex problems to be solved. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, somebody. Uh, I mean, but if you look at the size of the comparable Corbus mm -hmm. stack, I don't know. I mean it's a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. the, the size of the specifications are a lot smaller mm -hmm. now. That's a very high-level comment, and it may be unfair. Okay, no, but I'll just leave it at that. All right. So maybe, maybe to to um, back to MDA. Um, so maybe you want to give us an overview of where you are today, what you're working on, where you think we should be going. Well, one of the things that uh, I uh, wrote quite a bit about and spoke about. Uh, when I was introducing, when I was one of the people that was introducing MDA to the industry in the earlier part of this decade, and I predicted a certain area of where raising the level of abstraction would give us a very, uh, one of the most uh, useful paybacks, uh, and that I thought would happen uh, most quickly. And that was in uh, data, uh, data integration, data mapping. Uh, so the, the classic problem that an integration analyst has, they've got this data format or message format and this other one and they have to map them. It's just enormous amounts of IT resources go into solving those problems. There's all sorts of legacy systems around that are, you can't unplug. It's too expensive to uh, replace these systems and you have to do all these translations. Um, it costs uh, industry, it costs the economy. I've seen economic economic. Uh, 
econometric studies uh, that show incredibly, really su mm -hmm. surprising amount of impact overall on the global economy mm -hmm. from this, the amount of resources expended on that problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we can, and what I thought we would be able to do, and that there are MDA languages for, but you know whether it was going to be with an MDA language or some other, you know, non. You know, standard language. Uh, it seemed to me that we ought to. You know, we, we, we were getting to the point where we could raise the level of abstraction. Where uh, instead of writing low-level code for every one of those mappings, you you could present the integration analyst with a with a, a mapping tool. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, there's lots of these out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you put the integration analyst in front of a big you know, in front of a big screen. And they have the two formats down the one side of the screen. You know, one side of the, the left side of the screen, the, they see the one format, and the right side of the screen, they see the other format. They draw lines between the, the between you know from from, mm -hmm. the, from one field on the left side to a field on the right side. Yeah. They attach expressions to those lines, mm -hmm. and the code is generated, or else it's executed on the fly. Today, there are all sorts of integration tools out there mm -hmm. that do that and yeah. do it very effectively. Mm -hmm. So we. We did make we we've succeeded, maybe not always with MDA mm -hmm. you know tools based on the MDA stack, but in principle we succeeded in, in making that um, in making that leap. Now there's a now, however, in doing that we've solved maybe twenty percent of the problem of the, of of the for the integration analyst. Mm -hmm. So what we what we what we've accomplished is once the integration analyst has decided what the mapping should be, mm -hmm. it's relatively easy compared to the way it used to be, for them to specify that mapping and they don't have to write a lot of low-level code and they can do it with, you know, and, and, and they don't have to, um, uh, you know, get bogged down in the mechanics of how to actually ex execute the mapping. And that's a genuine advance. Mm -hmm. But th we still, th these tools give the integration analysts absolutely n no help Mm. in deciding what that mapping should be. Okay. So once they've decided what it should be, okay, okay, it's e much easier to actually execute. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where, you know, semantic interoperability comes into play. And I've been doing this where I've been doing quite a bit of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in in my role in, in my in, in standards and also in mm -hmm. inside the company that I work for. Um, we uh, we have been uh, we've made some real advances there. Mm -hmm. So you 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 basically uh, all the metadata, all yeah. the machine readable metadata that we have about these mm -hmm. these schemas is purely syntactical. Getting mm -hmm. back to syntax versus mm -hmm. semantics, it's all syntactical metadata. Yeah. And the fact that we have the syntactical metadata is mm -hmm. what allows the kinds of tools I just described, mm -hmm. you know, that generate code, you know, that to, to function. So that's yeah. it. So, okay, we need that syntactic metadata yeah. right, that describes the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the formats, okay. But there's absolutely no machine-readable mm -hmm. semantic metadata. So mm -hmm. there's nothing for a tool to grab onto to yeah. give a analyst some guidance Mm -hmm. They have no underlying semantic information about these data elements, and to give the mm -hmm. semantic, uh, to give the integration analyst some guidance, and we don't. The econometric studies that have been done on the on the cost of data integration tell us that we don't have to s perform magic here. Mm -hmm. We don't have to magically create some kind of super intelligent machine that can automatically do these mappings. Okay, yep. if we can improve mm -hmm. by helpful. You know, suggestions with 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 analysts always having the of override, yeah. or you know, telling them they may have done something wrong. You mm -hmm. know, uh, if we can improve their productivity by thirty percent, mm -hmm. the economic return is enormous. Yeah, enormous. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, and I think we can say that now we've re we're making some real progress there. And the basic the basic mm -hmm. way this is approached, uh, and you see it in some of the. It, some of the people who are listening to this may have heard of core components from UNC mm -hmm. fact that they've done some of the basic work. It's based mm -hmm. on a, on a, it's kind of a concretization of an earlier standard called ISO 11179, mm -hmm. part five in particular. Uh, and they, they actually have constructed a grammar for mm -hmm. a data, for a data element. Yeah. It's a basic grammar. So just like 
Okay, we think about um, we have uh, in just the English language, we have a dictionary full of words. Mm -hmm. Now those words are assembled into mm -hmm. sentences. Yep. Now, we, I mean, we called it sentence diagramming in the U.S. when I was mm -hmm. studying grammar when I was a child. Mm -hmm. They would have us break down the sentence. We'd look at a sentence and we'd say, mm -hmm. what is the subject? Where's, this word is playing the role of subject in mm -hmm. this sentence. This word is playing the role of direct object. Mm -hmm. This word is playing the role of indirect object. So there are these certain roles that the words in your dictionary assume in the context mm -hmm. of this sentence. Similarly, mm -hmm. what these... Um, this technology I've just been describing does is it, it finds you have a controlled vocabulary of mm -hmm. terms with information in there about what, what things are synonym, synonyms, mm -hmm. what are homos. Mm -hmm. And now you have a grammar for a data element has, a, a, you've got underlying metadata that tells you mm -hmm. what is the, there's a role that a term can play, not necessarily the name, yeah. there's a role that it can play, there's property term, representation term, yeah. You know, property qualified. There's a various roles that these mm -hmm. terms can play. And what we're starting to do is, with new specs and even retrospectively going up and marking up old specs mm -hmm. with, with semantic metadata that says, this data element mm -hmm. has a concept, mm -hmm. has this thing as a concept. This is its property term, or this is its representation term. Representation for term, for example, is a very high level data uh, kind of data type. It says, well, mm -hmm. it's it's an identifier, or it's a code, or it's yeah. a name. I'm not sure I fully followed. So when you typically control vocabulary that, say, use it in the medical domain because you want to make it possible for not IT people with some re some thoroughness of thinking to mm -hmm. express sentences which effectively are specifications. Mm -hmm. So the controlled vocabulary you're talking about is meta vocabulary to annotate existing specifications or a vocabulary you use to model new domains? It's, um, it can be used for both. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, you would have things like, I mean, I work in the financial services domain. That's mm -hmm. my primary domain I, I, I work in. And uh, you know, you things you have things you'll have things like checking account in there. Mm -hmm. um, usually, you wouldn't define account as an atomic term. Mm -hmm. It's just too it's too general. You know, you would define checking account though as a mm -hmm. as a, an atomic, But then you might, and then you you would have a balance, mm -hmm. and you would have code, identifier, name, things mm -hmm. like that. And then, with the data element, you can say. Mm -hmm. There's prescribed roles, just like in a sentence, we have the role of a direct object, the role of an indirect object. There are prescribed mm -hmm. roles that those play mm -hmm. conceptually in yeah. the data element, and that can be used. So here's a classic error that, that, that people who mm -hmm. get who are into this kind of stuff uh, like this is a good, good, good example of an, an error that an integration analyst can make. Mm -hmm. So in one branch of the military service, this is a this is actually um, sort of more from a defense uh, mm -hmm. domain than a finance domain. But in one branch of the military, a tank is a military vehicle. Mm -hmm. In another branch of the military service, a tank is a fuel container. Mm -hmm. So the analyst has got this. Okay, they got our modern mapping tools up there. On the left side, they see tank. In this field, they see tank. On the right side, they see tank is somewhere in there, and they draw the line. Ouch. <laughs> okay. Now, mm -hmm. that happens, and those are subtle errors that can take enormous resources to, to hunt down and mm -hmm. cost a lot of money. Now, I'm not saying that our techniques, remember I said mm -hmm. we don't have to have, a mag, have magic here, but mm -hmm. you know, if you have a controlled vocab, if, if, there's, if these, they've been tagged, these, you know, there's underlying semantic mm -hmm. metadata that says tank here, tank here, these are, and the tool set, the, the mapping tool says, well, these are actually two separate entries in the dictionary mm -hmm. with a homonym relationship between them. Yeah. You know, the analyst, you may want to reconsider that line you just drew there, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, because they, they're both, yes, they're both used as uh, your um, property term mm -hmm. here, but they're yeah. different. Well, if you already have in your dictionaries uh, the, that these are two different terms, it's, it's one thing. That certainly helps. But if you have a specification of these terms independently of each other, you do specification matching. Well, that suggests there's a fair amount of uh, work still to be done. Um, I had a related question. Uh, maybe I shouldn't. Well, I'm, I'm really curious. So because you went back to integration scenarios. So I, this is yeah. a recurring topic yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, yeah. it's not even a low hanging fruit. It's still a huge amount of work, um, yeah. but maybe it's the closest fruit we can get to. 
Um, here in the valley, Silicon Valley, for me, the question is, what does a startup do? And they just don't use uh, don't use these tools. So maybe, uh, as far as I know, they don't really use a lot of MDA tools. Maybe because they can create their homogenous world right from the beginning. They take established technology stacks and then they develop that ten percent additional application software on top of that. If you were to make a very long shot at even startups, people under significant pressure, but who are able to put uh, so many constraints into the ground that are not mm -hmm. given from the outside world. They can still choose what technology stack they take, etc. So they make sure they have a homogenous world. When would they benefit from MDA and how could they use it? What needs to happen uh, for that to, to be a viable option for a startup? Once again, I think we have to, uh, in answering that question, I'm going to distinguish between MDA, the brand named the mm -hmm. particular technology stack from yes. the OMG, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the general concept of raising the level of abstraction. Mm -hmm. And there I think there's, um, there's a lot that can be done. I mean, in, in, in you see it in different ways. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many tools out there that in some form or another raise the level of abstraction for you. I mean, even what we don't consider we don't normally consider model-driven tools. You start off a new project to build a new component, and they they but they bring up uh, a dialogue, mm -hmm. and they ask you to say, well, what do you, do you want to use? Beam? Do you want to use Beam managed persistence, or do you want to use mm -hmm. this? They ask you, and maybe even higher level questions that they ask you a lot of questions. You fill in radio, you know, radio buttons, check boxes, mm -hmm. all sorts of options. They generate a at least a starter code, and now mm -hmm. what? The real difference when I say something's really model-driven is when that is not your last view of that picture, because mm -hmm. that's essentially, a, a, in a sense, an abstraction of certain aspects mm -hmm. of the architecture of your system. Um, if that picture can be recalled mm -hmm. and can be adjusted, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. and you've got the it, you've got it integrated. Mm -hmm. You're really doing, I mean, whether you're using UML, whether you're using yeah. a graphical language, a textual language, a forms based language, mm -hmm. you're raising the level of abstraction in a yeah. way that supports iterative development. If you raise the level of abstraction and you don't support iterative development, mm -hmm. it's not practical, yeah. right? So, you know, I, I don't want to be dogmatic about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many ways to approach this. There yeah. are certain advantages to following standards, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if you um, if you want to use a form-based uh, interface, uh, but you know there's certain advantages to uh, defining your underlying meta model using mm -hmm. some of the standards, MOF, EMF, things like that, because mm -hmm. then it's easier for people to integrate your stuff into their into their mm -hmm. stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that uh, that's the way I would look at it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you're ultimately you're just trying to make people more productive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I'm at the end of my uh, questions. So, um, do you have something that you would like to say that we didn't touch on uh, yet? Uh, well, the only thing I want to uh, mention is that uh, you, when I talked about the, some of the semantic interoperability work going on, I just wanted to point out that this was. Um, there is still more work to be done. However, I want to point out that it's more than just an idea at this point. So there are um, there is major implementation work going on around this um, in a number of different segments of industry mm -hmm. now. And I think you're going to start to see uh, the emergence of a new class of tools that are going to be pretty interesting. I don't think they will saw. I think they'll get better. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the techniques for how we go back and retrospectively mark up metadata, we're going to we're going to we have some some learning to do about mm -hmm. that. But I just wanted to point out it was a, it's it's more than on the drawing board. Mm -hmm. But yes, there's still work to do. Um, so yeah, I just I just think we're 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 on a quest to make things to be more productive and more mm -hmm. accurate yeah. and more reliable. Mm -hmm. And that that's really the goal. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we will uh, put uh, more information about David Frankel and uh, maybe some pointers of where to look at your work into the show notes. So uh, that's it from the Silicon Valley for Soft Engineering Radio. Uh, thanks, everyone, and goodbye. Thanks, David. Thank you.
Thanks for downloading and listening to Software Engineering Radio. Software Engineering Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and all the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website. Or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick Reddit Delicious and Slash Dot buttons. To contact the team, please send email to team at se-radio.net or if it is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio as well as all other episodes are licensed under a Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks to Charlie Crow and the Podsafe Music Network for the music used in this show. The song is called Vegas Hard Rock Shuffle. <laughs>